Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm back with Thad McElroy. Hi Thad. Hi Joanna, how are you? I am good and it's so great to have you back on the show. It's been over 18 months since you were on the show in July 2015 and a lot's changed in the future of publishing, hasn't it? It certainly has. Yeah, thank <laughs> gosh for that. It's yeah. very interesting for all of us. So we have a lot to talk about, but just a little introduction. Thad is a journalist, author, speaker, and publishing consultant specializing in the future of publishing. And he actually has the website Future of Publishing, which is just amazing. I mean, it's such a good uh, URL. Um, so we're going to start straight away with publishing and machine learning. We've both read the bestseller code, Anatomy of the Blockbuster Novel by Jody Archer and Matthew jockers which came out last year and you wrote a blog post on it several actually um so i wanted to know what are your thoughts on how publishers are using or will be using machine learning in this kind of bestseller way good question tough question so it's, you're starting off with the with the, 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 the maybe the toughest one because it's it's complicated on a couple of sides the on the one hand we have to get some definitions out of the way right away mm. um, I've been talking to some colleagues a lot about this the last few weeks we all say artificial intelligence and you know artificial intelligence then makes them think about you know IBM's you know Watson computer uh, taking on and you know, winning in chess and then go and you think about you know tra Google's language translation some really heavy duty tech technologies that are reliant on something that could be described as AI um, on the other hand much of what people are referring to when they say AI is more um, pedantic or uh, down to earth or simpler technologies such as being able to you know crunch through uh, 10,000 novels and try and find a repeating word pattern in there and there's no sort of intelligence per se other than the, the programmer who put the thing together you're really using the the horsepower of uh, a lot of computers that you can access through things like Amazon's web service and at the same time what you're accessing that that's new is these what they call corpuses, um, these large uh, databases of of text information, of demographic information, and you go in and you can crunch things that we didn't have the power to crunch before, and we didn't have the information that was worth crunching. Um, and so if for people who want to get a handle on this, I'd really recommend their first step is to go to Wikipedia, you know, and start with artificial intelligence, get a little handle on how that's defined and keep a skeptical eye on some of the more grand clan claims about it but then go to machine learning go to nlp natural language processing mm. text mining and see what the definitions of those are and you know, think that through because if you want to understand what the opportunity is for the book publishing industry and self-published authors it, it has to be something that's um uh, you know, some more nitty gritty than some nefarious, magical AI cloud type mm. of thing. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I was going to say that. The, yeah, yeah, the natural language processing, I think, is what is interesting because, of course, as writers, we're always thinking about what word to use in this way and as you say all they did really was um tell a machine uh, tell a database you know to pull out uh, emotional words um and where they were in a percentage of the book and say you know the da vinci code and 50 shades of gray had the same emotional journey even though they're completely different books so as you say how intelligent is that? And I guess from an author perspective, should we be looking at books like The Bestseller Code and trying to reverse engineer? Or should we just kind of go, you know, whatever, and just carry on writing what we love? Yes, exactly. It, it is intriguing. And again, you know, I guess we want to recommend to people that they pick up The Bestseller Code. It's, it's a fascinating book. And the authors are scientists. They're both PhDs in, in their subject area. And they have done truly extensive research in building the book. So, you know, when I first heard about the book, I thought it was going to be by, you know, two 
people who just saw an opportunity to take advantage but didn't really know their stuff. These folks really know their stuff. And again, you know, some of the, the technologies I was just talking about, they have an appendix to the book that gives a pretty good description of how to apply their these technologies to the analysis of manuscripts. So they took, as I recall, about 5,000 best-selling books um, and went in and, and tried to find things like that, such as you're saying, emotional arcs within certain kinds of words. I, the one that always amused me was that um, you have a better chance of a bestseller if there's a dog than a cat in there is one of the things they counted up. Uh, so with all of those things, then they, they were able to come up with a fairly elaborate description of the kinds of components that you would find in these best-selling books they claim about an 80 percent accuracy and so then when it came to the obvious question okay should an author follow the formula um, they're very clear that, that that's not what they're suggesting and yet as I noted in my blog post they may say they're not saying that I think they're really you know, sort of covering their behinds on that sense because in fact it is quite prescriptive mm. it's very prescriptive as to the type Types of things that that authors should do if they want to get these kind of a best-selling structure. Uh, however, our last thing on that is, you know, as I was reading that through, I was thinking, gosh, this could be any of dozens of books mm -hmm. on, you know, how to write a great novel, how to write compelling fiction, how to create great characters. Uh, it didn't seem at that level all that extraordinary. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Like, for example, I think they said something like shorter sentences, you know, will mean, <laughs> yeah, and it's like, well, right. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of, that's one of the things that people tell you. And yeah, right. so, but anyway, I thought it was a really interesting book and, and reading it made me think more. And in fact, um, machine learning in general, of course, Amazon's algorithm is a machine learning thing that we, we don't know how it works, but people make educated guesses every single day. Yeah, and la last do. time we talked about how hopefully the book itself will be metadata. That hasn't happened yet, unfortunately. I hope it does at some point. But the, one of the things that a lot of authors are asking me is, um, should we be as authors trying to make sure the algorithm can tell what type of books we write and the audience we have? So I have two author names, Joanna Penn, who writes nonfiction for authors, and J.F. Penn writes thrillers. So it used to be like, yes, that's a branding thing for covers and everything. But now, is this a big data thing where we should be trying to educate the algorithms with very clear distinctions? And is that something that we're going to see more of? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And that's really the heart of the matter in many ways. Let's start with the, the thing that you and I enjoy, the idea of the book as metadata, which you know, I think we're the two holders of that idea. <laughs> you know, and it's an intriguing sense, right, that if we can abstract a title, a short description of a book, um, then surely if we can delve in with machine power to the whole book, we can extract a tremendously larger um, set of information um, you know, of course, with nonfiction, it's easier, but even with fiction, I mean, you can pick up themes, you can pick up locales, you can mm. pick up, you know, uh, types of activities, blah, blah, blah. and that is a, a, a metadata abstraction from the book. What, what I've seen since then is I spent some time trying to understand how Google Scholar works, mm. and Google Scholar is, a, you know, it, it, people think that it's an extension of the Google search engine, but in fact, it's, it's a separate technology. It was built in a different way uh, using different kinds of um, um, software to detect uh, responses to queries. Google Scholar does surface a lot of books, generally not fiction, but what what Google Scholar insists on in order to quickly surface a piece of information is that there be a meta description of that information. And it's like, oh, so what's that mean in terms of a book? I th I've been thinking of it in terms of nonfiction books. And what I, I got in touch with the folks who are behind, the scientists there, and they said, you actually have to do an abstraction of each chapter and we're going to search the description of the chapter, not the chapter itself, as a more efficient way of accessing, you know, getting certain results to searches, to getting accurate results. And that got me thinking more where, okay, yeah, the book itself is meta, but in fact, um, 
what the book is about can it can be described separately from the book itself. So you know, if you you say it's a you know a book about uh, the tragic death of a child and the impact that has on the family and a community, that concept would be difficult to abstract from the book. It never says that exactly in the book, this sort mm. of thing. So if people are searching for you know uh, books that you know represent you know the the a tragic impact on a small community. Um, you know, that might not show up in the data within the book, yet it will show up in the data that's on the on Amazon in the description of the book. It will show up in some of the reviews of the book. That language in particular will show up. Mm. All of this by saying, you know, it's pretty complicated. I think from an author's perspective, if anything, I mean, the meta that they create of the book itself is done. You wrote the book, that meta exists. If you put it into the into Google Books, it's searchable and was searchable by Google. So you're already making the meta available. What I, I think is most important to authors is the external meta instances of the book. And this is why I believe authors need rich websites because the website mm. becomes the biggest proxy for the, for the finding of a book. It's the place where you can most control the kind of content that you make available. Uh, people think about keywords on Amazon, but keywords are really something far broader and should be built in, for example, you know, into the meta headings of a website. Uh, so for authors, I think the, the meta choice is really a, a, uh, an elaborate, in-depth strategy that needs to cover off through a lot of different channels. And everyone's freaking out now because that sounds like a lot of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, does. I, it, it might not be quite as hard work. It's getting your mind around it is yeah, the tough thing. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> and But you and I are obviously still annoyed about this. And I and I didn't um, uh, say this in, in the notes I sent you, but quantum computing, which I've started to see things about, which um, I can't explain. I think Justin Trudeau explained it recently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the wonderful Justin. Um, but in terms of like, where we are now, like you're saying, like even Google has to have a smaller version of the book in order to, you know, do things in a timely manner. But quantum computing, from what I've heard, will change the way calculations are done and the amount of data that can be held. And a shift like that, which seems almost like a big shift, uh, could yes. mean that more data could be used in a in a deeper way. Um, Again, I didn't remind you of this beforehand, but any thoughts on how that kind of shift would change things? I think that you know, the, we've seen in computing for a long time that increase in power. There's Moore's law that you know every 18 months the processing power doubles, and the, in generally uh, along the same time the the cost of that power goes down by 50 percent, and. That law, some people have argued, is reaching near its, you know, its its uh, technical limit. But then I've been reading other really fascinating papers that show that the uh, rise in computing power is, I mean, for all intents and purposes is limitless. I mean, the power that you've got at your disposal with the IBM system, uh, Deep Blue, is, is you know is so enormous that there's really no problem that even today cannot be addressed by the computing horsepower that anyone has access to. Mm -hmm. So if ever people are thinking, well, gosh, you know, we have to go through 50,000 books to try and extract a certain kind of data and apply it against a certain question, you can do it. You know, sometimes the computing might run for, you know, six or eight hours, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. And um, so the limits become more about formulating the problem that you're trying to solve. I mean, that's that, that to me is the big thing is trying to get that kind of intersection. Well, if all of this is possible and if this is what we're doing now, how do I think about the kinds of issues I'd like to see addressed and then try and map them up against that technology? Mm. And that's what I've been going through, um, working with a couple of other people, is trying to think about startups in the AI space. Mm. It's like, what are the problems that we need to solve? And can AI address those problems? Mm. Oh, we, now you've mentioned it, let's talk about your um, report on publishing startups, um, looking mm. at innovation in the industry um, over the past few years. What 
what has survived, what has thrived. And I picked up a couple of uh, ones I wanted to mention. Um, yesterday in Britain, Hachette bought Bookature, which is one of these yes. uh, big startup digital publishing. Uh, there's no details on the money, but it, this is huge because Bookature was the, the most successful digital publisher startup in the UK, bought by Hachette. Uh, Bonnier uh, launching Type & Tell, a self-publishing platform offering 100% royalties at London <laughs> Book Fair next week. So Type & Tell, kind of a startup, but by Bonnier, another traditional publisher. Off the back of Macmillan, another big publisher, buying Pronoun, um, yep. a self-publishing platform. So I was fascinated because these are three, these are two self-publishing platforms and a digital publishing platform, um, which are yep. all kind of startups, all being subsumed into big publishing. So coming back to your report, what have you seen that has survived? What's been bought? What's died? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, the, it's actually great the ones you just raised because they are symptomatic of certain things that I saw in the report. A bookature, when I read about that yesterday, it was like, oh, this is interesting. I'll go to my, first I'll go to my spreadsheet. Is bookature there? It's not there. Uh -huh. How did I miss that one? I've got 900 startups <laughs> on my spreadsheet. I've been collecting them like a madman for f over five years now, and some still slipped my notice. But then, you know, when I looked more closely at Bookature, I thought, is it in fact a digital publishing startup? They call themselves that, mm. but all they, the, the, what was described primarily on the website was that you, their, um, Technology is essentially the same as anybody else's. Mm -hmm. What they say as their sort of primary distinction is the amount of detail uh, that they put into the editorial, into the design, and certainly into the promotion and the online marketing. And any publisher should be doing that. Yeah, you no, you're right. I think you know it's 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 that that they were acquired by a larger publisher is kind of an admission of failure on their part mm -hmm. to have done what they should have done by this time, right? So. Uh, um, but nonetheless, you know, hats off to Bookature, right? They grew very quickly, very successful, smart people, you know, congratulations. That's wonderful. Uh, the it, it, starting a, as a self-published service in the, within the aegis of a larger publisher, I mean, there too, it's, they should be coming with, you know, very red faces of mm -hmm. saying, why didn't we think of this sooner? And we're trying now to kind of apologize with a startup that it will offer all of these royalties. And there they're undermining the, uh, you know, the other uh, large self-publishing services who cannot compete on price, right? Who cannot compete on margin. And so it, from a self-published author's perspective, oh, well, should I go to pronoun now instead of Smashwords, Lulu, you name it? Um, yeah, well, the economic decision is yes. And so now it becomes a question of the competition at the infrastructural level. And certainly, you know, those the the players that have been playing for a while have really strong. They're plugged in now. They're plugged into library networks. Their their marketing ideas are quite evolved and so on. But that all of that by saying that the there's a continuing evolution in the types of startups that are that we're seeing and the uh, kind of activity that that's in gendering in the larger publishing industry. Uh, I'll pause there. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I guess, you know, it's interesting because Pronoun started off originally as Vuk, I think, back in the day. And Vuk, um, I remember interviewing the guy who started Vuk about video video books that's why it was called book you'd got like it wasn't an app it was like a video book and it was the book but it had some video in it and that didn't work and then they pivoted and did something else and now pivoted and now got bought um which you know just makes me a little bit confused but um i wondered you know those are actual like publishing startups but of the other problem of course is marketing did you see um and the one i remember of course i think we mentioned it last time is small demons which i liked because it was a kind of um if, if a book mentions Oxford, here are other books that mention Oxford. It was like a more of a theme and place linking type of discovery engine, which I really liked. So, so have, have you seen sort of the marketing startups appearing at all? Um, I mean, Bookershaw did really well off Facebook ads, but as you say, that shouldn't be anything special. So have there been any special startups that you're really interested in? 
the most successful one is, is it BookBub that does the free promotions? Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. And you know they've turned that into a very solid business. Mm. Um, you know, and so what's the idea of the business? Real simple: a curated selection of of free and low priced eBooks on short term promotions. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, it, when that was described as a business plan, people must have you know eyes rolled over. But in fact, it's they executed so well mm. um, that it's become a coveted you know promotional vehicle. The lots of um, uh, copycat startups of that. In terms of really innovative ideas, I'm not seeing a heck of a lot. Where, where you do see an idea, just when you start to get excited about it, you realize that the company's not very well developed, they're not financed, they haven't really thought through how to you know, execute at scale. Um, and so it's it's been disappointing to me in a lot of cases. One of the biggest conundrums around these startups is that you know anybody can start a website in 24 hours and put it up there and claim that it's you know an enabling service. And many many of these startups are, are really just about I call you know sort of good intentions in a website. And what we're hoping to see more of over the next few years is these is companies starting to operate at scale. You know where there's more than the founders available. You know by email to reach where um, mm. th they've worked through some of the problems and figured out how to do the kind of pivot that Volk had to do before they became successful. Mm. What about Wattpad? Um, because of course they yeah. yeah they've just released Tap in the last week, which is like a really quite cool if you're if you're a young person um, younger than me, where you kind of tap and a new thing appears and you can find a story there. They've got Wattpad Studios now, sort of making yes. films and IP off the back of that. Um, what so what do you think of Wattpad? Because they they're one of the uh, better known startups, I guess. I call them the poster child uh -huh. because everyone tends to reference Wattpad because they, they're exciting, right? And they've been hugely successful and they raised a lot of money, nearly mm -hmm. $70 million. And I remember when they got the last chunk, which was about $45 million, they said, oh, we don't need the money. We're, we're just putting it in the bank should we need it down the road. And then so – but I was watching them and thinking, okay, $70 million, the, the usual number that we use uh, in terms of what the expectations expectations of the VCs are when they make an investment is that they realistically think they can get a 10 times payout. Mm -hmm. So they can sell this thing for $700 million, upwards of a billion dollars. Um, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so then you look at Wattpad and say, okay, how are you monetizing, using that word, or how are you starting to find ways to attract income? And when the, you know, as with so many startups that look for scale, by attracting users for no cost, um, you know they've been hugely successful getting a very large number of users, albeit with, as you imply, a kind of limited demographic. And then you see something like the studio idea, and you think, how much money is that going to bring in? Yeah, you know, what's their cut of the action going to be on that? You know, hundred thousand in a really you know big instance if they can get that kind of money. So it points to another problem that you see when you look at my startup report. It's like, what's the revenue model? They might have a pretty good idea. Wattpad's really interesting and fun and kind of, you know, worth sort of thinking is this part of the future of publishing, but also will they be around in five years? Mm. That's really interesting. And I mean, being around in five years is uh, something I've been thinking about in terms of Amazon, because in the last week, we've seen um, a new author earnings report about the dominance of Amazon across, um, you know, America, UK, Australia, Canada, um, New Zealand. Um, Amazon won two Oscars with Manchester by the sea. Yes. Amazon yes. Prime TV is absolutely massive. Um, a digital book world, it was announced that 45% of all book sales are happening digitally, including print sold online. And that Amazon has taken a massive share of that print. The um, There was another thing that said Amazon's um, own imprint. So Amazon Publishing is taking up to 50% of the top 20 books on um, Amazon, you know, Kindle store. So, you know, and Nook we've seen is, you know, the revenues are down again. So if you like look five years ahead, as you, as you say, if things continue as they are, is Amazon going to be the only one left selling anything? Exactly. I mean, how how do you see that playing out? Um, I'm I'm frightened 
frankly. You know, it's if you, historically, if you look at you know, concentration of corporate power within a particular industry, it reaches a point where it's no longer productive. It becomes counterproductive. Um, it's it tends to stifle innovation. It restricts the ability of other players to grow within that space. When on my blog, whenever I've criticized Amazon, I get you know deluged by self-published authors who how dare you? Sorry. You know, they've made a huge difference to and and I, I don't take anything away from them. I think you know they're brilliant. Uh, they execute again and again and again, doing the right things, as you say. You know, they there's Netflix so well established, and Amazon goes in to compete with Netflix, a, a hugely intelligent company, and already they're succeeding at that as well. And you know, and they're also competing with Apple. I was also surprised in that in the author earnings report to see how far Apple slipped. Yeah. Uh, you know, very low numbers, and you think about that, and, and Google's Apple not even on the ashamed. page. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? it? It's extraordinary that way, which speaks, you know, both to Amazon's brilliance and to it's a, quite a bit of incompetence, one would say, and an undercommitment on the part of those people. But from an author's perspective, you know, I, I think that this is becoming a, a problem. I mean, you saw the Kobo numbers, right? Now that was only English language markets. Uh, you know, they're they're still doing pretty well in Canada because of the launch, having started there historically. Um, but that has to be a concern to a self-published mm -hmm. author. You know, and you look at this situation where, you know, do you only publish on Amazon because they're going to cover off 80% of your sales or more for certain genres? And I think, no, that can't be a good thing. I, I, I can't. I can't find a way of saying it's better that way than it would be if Amazon was at 50% and we had a strong set of competitors. Mm, you've got to blame Nook for this as well, because they had a oh. big chunk of the US market and they just let it go. And when they shut down all their international stores, I was just like, I'm sorry that, you know, that's crazy. It really annoyed me. <laughs> yeah, yeah me too. There's just yeah. a downward spiral, right? And you say they let it go. They actually, you know, they <laughs> neglect would let it go. They were aggressively incompetent. <laughs> they spent a lot of money ruining their business. <laughs> they hired a lot of high, you know, high priced staff to ruin their business. So it was done not by not paying enough attention. It was done by making a series of catastrophically stupid decisions, such as shutting on the international yeah, market. That was crazy. So uh, it's interesting because as we're talking about this, I'm. it's the week before London Book Fair as we record this. And there's a massive talk about foreign rights being the biggest thing this year. And I'm wondering, is this because people's revenues are falling compared to the Amazon? You know, everyone's looking at Amazon and going, our revenues are falling from English language sales. So we now have to make this up in the markets where Amazon isn't yet strong. I mean, maybe I'm just making that up, but it kind of feels that way. That's really interesting. You would say that I, I, that author earnings report. My first interpretation of that is that it's a complete condemnation of the rights infrastructure on which so much of commercial publishing is based. And, you know, that's just always been the way, right, that the British publishers, American publishers, they want to sell rights in other territories. Sounds great if you actually sell them. But, you know, it's only for the most popular books that you get a kind of consistent coverage if you're basing your international activities on rights sales. And what the author earnings report shows is that, in fact, to be a self-published author working directly directly in those marketplaces, you're going to sell a heck of a lot more books than if you're with, than if you're, you know, we're with one of the big five or even similar sized publishers. And they're, they're going to get right sales and, you know, maybe they'll get one in UK. Will Australia be an afterthought of that right sale? Uh, they'll get France, but not Germany. They'll get, you know, Poland, but not Turkey. This kind of thing is the standard pattern. So it, for publishers to default to believing that that's the answer, or an answer to the current malaise? I don't think it is. I, the answer to the malaise, as author earnings is proving, is to be in your own driver's seat internationally. I think you've proven that mm -hmm. with your books. I know that you've got wonderful sales in, in multiple markets. Mm. But what's interesting is, for me now, is the translation model. So you mentioned the Google Translate earlier. So 
I mean, we're looking to license my books into foreign language markets because I tried self-publishing in German and Italian and Spanish uh, and it just didn't work because I can't market in those languages and there isn't an, a book bub, there isn't an ecosystem for marketing as an indie. So we're looking at licensing. But I see this almost as a short-term thing because, as you say, Google Translate. So I have a vision, and we'll come back to um, augmented reality in a minute, but I have a vision that you just put on your glasses and be able to look at a foreign language language text and read it in English or oh, I love that. vice versa. <laughs> so you wouldn't even, you know, are we looking at a future with things like Google Translate, which I haven't tried it, but you could be speaking in French and I could be understanding you in English. Like it's already that good. Are we looking at that coming into the written and reading and audio uh, in the future, do you think? So we won't even have to do translations. That's great. Lovely questions. You're, you're thinking about a lot of these things. It's fun to chat. Uh, the translation, you know, my first response would be that it's not nearly as good as the hype would have it. Mm. Um, and, you know, the, the thing is that you can do a reasonable job pretty easily um, with Google, the current Google Translate technology. It does not a bad job of a relatively simple document. I think, you, you know, one would be, one would look at it and say, yeah, this is 85% as good as if we had a real translator working on it. When it comes to a novel full of nuance, forget it. The yeah. translation's nowhere near there. I don't think anyone should be thinking of that on their radar at this point. Um, you know, Javier Solea in, in Spain, the consultant there, he's a very, very smart guy. And we were chatting at Digital Book World about the issue of um, placing books in foreign markets in English language. So, you know, mm. selling German, Italy, uh, English language books. And he had a really good idea, which is make sure that you translate all of the uh, associated marketing material. It makes sense as soon as he said it, you know, that you're in Germany. Yes, you're able to read English. English and you're interested in English language books, but far better you get the description in your own language, that your first encounter with that book is going to be in your own language. But he pointed out that, you know, this is the thing that was like, yeah, zing, metadata, keywords. Mm. Yeah, keywords in another language are going to be different keywords than the ones you would use, you know, in English. Using English keywords, um, you know, in Germany makes no sense whatsoever. They're going to be searching on in their own language for keywords. That's how books are going to surface. I don't think Amazon allows that. Onyx does. If you use the Onyx, you know, metadata structure, you can do that. Um, no, but you, as you I, can. It, you can. I did that with mine. You just put in. You, I got my translator to do the to give me the words. So she did the search, and you can just put them in. But the difficulty was just, you know, there isn't the the infrastructure in the book promotional sense, like you know, like a book bub in in German, for example. But that's probably a pick for the next five. years years is that this ecosystem in translation has to mature a bit more um, in yes. the self-publishing space. Yes. When you change the metadata into German, for example, did you, I mean, if you, are you able to list separately on Amazon Germany so that that metadata is ingested separately from yeah, English metadata? You, you, well, when you upload a German book, so it has to be a separate book. So I'm okay. talking about, but yeah, I know what you mean. So you're saying an English language book using German metadata. That's a really yes. good, and this is a, this is one of the problems we have is that you have to publish one book once, otherwise you get a copyright notice. So I would love to have a different cover in America than in Britain because we have such different tastes in yes. covers, and that and that's why publishers do it. Um, but yes. at the moment, we all have only one method to publish globally yep. um, so I think these things are going to definitely change um, in the next in the next few years so I did I also wanted to ask you like in terms of exciting things um, that are happening one thing you and I did not see coming last time was the rise of Alexa and I'm going to say her name live now I was stopping but they they're releasing a voice recognition update so hopefully my voice won't trigger anyone listening <laughs> on her <laughs> so right. yeah so Amazon's in-home uh, device and um, we have have one and it's awesome and Google Home of course and, and Apple has Siri um, but Alexa over last Christmas just went nuts right and it's in millions of homes and I'm excited about the rise of audiobooks and also any yes. kind of voice activated technologies stories things that we just haven't even thought of yet so what are your thoughts around Alexa and AI and how that can help publishing? 
great fun, first of all, right? We're all of us, we're having a lot of fun with these. <laughs> the voice recognition, yeah, I would we chatted before the call or emailed before this call. You know, I've, I've been frustrated with voice recognition technology over the years. And, you know, I, I use Dragon Naturally Speaking, yeah. and it's up to version 15 and finally has got it. You know, you now get about a 99% accuracy rate on translation, on voice dictation. Um, and that's something I, you know, I've been working with that software for 15 years. I was thinking I've probably given them $2,000 in upgrade fees over the years and none of it quite worked. So by the time you get a Siri and Alexa, um, we still have to address some of the quality issues. And you know, th what makes Dragon work is that there's a training module mm. and none of the other off-the-shelf uh, recognitions allow you to do the training, and so you you take a big hit in the accuracy. So that's the first thing. But then I'm being a party pooper if I say that. So let's say it's still it is wonderful. It works beautifully. Um, I think you're you're hitting nail on the head. I mean, this is the when we think of the future of publishing, it's going to be enabled by technologies that are coming out of some other field. And you're thinking, you know, people are thinking of Alexa being able to help them with their shopping. And you're thinking, you know, in far more exciting ways, somewhere at the intersection of book publishing, audiobooks, voice recognition, we're going to be seeing new ways of delivering content um, that if nothing else will promote the, the, the book, but even better will become another revenue stream, another opportunity for authors to rethink the way they deliver uh, to readers. Mm, yeah, I, I'm just super excited about it. But then you and I get excited about these geeky things anyway, don't you? <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. Out. Can't help it. I know. It's so cool. I love talking to you because I can just geek out and people can just turn off if they're not interested. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fun. But um, the other thing, I'm, I've just finished this book, The Fourth Transformation, How Augmented Reality and Artificial Intelligence Will Change Everything by Robert Scoble and Shell Israel. And what they basically talk about um, is this shift for, from um, handheld devices and the sort of head down approach into a typing into a screen or talking into a screen to the head up um, approach of, of glasses. Now, moving on from Google Glass, you know, which was a bit of a failure, it was a bit too early um they're talking about magic leap um which is still under yeah. under wraps i mean right. but what what they've sort of said with the patents and things and apple as well coming out with things that just look like you know um normal glasses and are augmented reality or mixed reality so you can see a layer on top of the world it's not like virtual reality where you put on a headset and disappear it's more that you're using it to see on top of the world and and that i that to me is very exciting you know first of all like just think about coming to digital book world as we do and seeing people's um, Twitter handles above their heads, um, seeing people's names. I mean, how useful would that be just on a basic yes. level? And then yes. I, I was thinking like, I would like to record myself walking around London. And then if you're in London, you could turn on my recording and I could guide you around my London where I, you know, have my book set and everything. So you get like a personalized tour through your headset, but you're still walking through London. So you get that on top. So I'm just so excited about this. What do you think about augmented reality and, and this kind of level? It's great to hear you talk about it. your your enthusiasm is wonderful. Your ideas make a whole lot of sense too. And when I think of the question, I, I, there's a okay two sides. Let's start on the real upside. Um, yeah, I've been working on the future of publishing for a long time now. And when we these startups that I did in the you know the report, the 900 startups, and I look at them and I say, where's the innovation in these? Where's the real innovation? I'm seeing a little bit of incremental idea changes but the real innovation. On the other hand, you know, the, the, the ones who have tried to innovate most dramatically have failed so far. And what we've seen is that, uh, if, let's think back for a moment to the um, enhanced ebook, mm. right? And that was a no-go, <laughs> right? There's a, a few of them that succeeded, but Touch Press, the, you know, the best developer of them, they had to abandon and they were hugely successful in terms of number of units moved. They couldn't make the economics of it work. And and 
but but it, something's going to right. We when I when I present to people on the competition to book publishing um, for these startups, the competition's not other startups in the publishing space. It's the fact that people are becoming more and more attuned to audio and video stimuli, let's say, um, than they are to the written word. The written word is becoming quite flat for a lot of people uh, that's been you know sort of cautioned for a long time but i think it wasn't in the old in when we used to worry about the the kind of print we were more worried that um it was becoming less interesting well, i think what we learned is print hasn't become any less interesting if anything it's more far more interesting because of writers like yourself who can tell wonderful stories and grab people and you know do continuous um you know work within the genre put out a lot of material so it's far more compelling than ever. But over here, video, the transformation in video, in music, in the way these things are delivered is so much more profound. And what what the book what book publishers, authors need to figure out again is, as with the voice recognition, how is this going to intersect? And how can we make this intersect? Probably we should be looking at it from the uh, from the point of view of someone who understands VR, virtual reality, for example, and doesn't know about book publishing. They can come to it fresh. We bring too much baggage in our thinking about what makes book publishing. I think it makes it hard for people to see some of the opportunities here. Having said all of that, that, again, the cautionary note, right? I, when I was thinking about us chatting, I was thinking last night and thinking, uh, 3D glasses, how is that working out for you? <laughs> and there's you know, a technology that's been around for what quite a few years, you know, and it had these various renaissance and, you know, currently supposedly isn't some sort of renaissance, but is already being dropped by a lot of directors. And mm. so, you know, and what went wrong with that? They don't want to put something on their face. You know, mm. it, it, it apparently it's a very simple usability issue that, you know, as long as there's something li that they have to wear that's, you know, that only is a single purpose to, um, tool, it's, it's not going to take off. So with VR, yeah, we're going to have to look to Apple and the magic startup and to see some real innovation that allows us to use existing devices in some sort of augmented fashion. Mm. I think what's interesting in that in that book, The Fourth Transformation, which I really recommend people read if they're interested in in this next level, is that um, when uh, Magic Leap is really under wraps, as they say, but uh, some of the people who've seen it are some of the most senior people in the, these tech industries, and they're calling it the first billion dollar industry straight out the gate, as in it's kind of going to reinvent the way the internet so i i just I, I mean yeah like you say lots of hyperbole but very interesting potential like if we talk again in 18 months which i hope we will then we'll be like okay has this happened or not they're saying it's but it's around 2020 2023 so it, you know it's interesting to see how fast it will happen so i i know we, we could talk forever but um yeah. I'm, I'm very wary of time but i want to just go to a completely different level and again i didn't put this in our notes um but thinking about what india has just done which is digitalize their currency and move to micro payments so what we've got is one of the biggest most populated countries in the world where so many people are rural they don't have bank accounts they don't have a physical address and they're moving to micro payments on cell phone devices because that's what people have they don't have a home necessarily but they have a cell right. phone um so they're digitizing the economy and the stuff i've been reading on in wired magazine about the way they're digitizing the economy this is apparently reinventing um the blockchain uh, going even further than bitcoin now for me as a independent author, I want in on India, I want in on sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America. And to me, micro payments, the kind of 0. 0.0001 rupee per page read of the yes. whatever billion people in India, that's what I right. want in on. So here, here's, you know, the complete radical shift. Are we, could we see a way where we publishing could shift to these micro payment models, which the music industry is too, with the streaming, um, you know, people are getting these micro payments. So uh, this is another idea that's exciting me, but any thoughts on, on that? We've, we've been hoping for micropayments for a long time because it does solve a big problem, you know, in terms of uh, how do you get a subset of your content 
how do you get remunerated for some some subset of your content? And the micropayment makes sense in that way. Uh, it's interesting, you know, but we haven't been able to make a system like that work in the Western world. India, you know, is a hotbed of innovation with very unique demographic challenges and it's perfect that the market is moving in that direction mm -hmm. uh, yes the blockchain technology c can enable that and then you know Apple pay becomes part of the play in that and it's you, you can start to imagine that the seamless mechanism for micropayments may be a possibility in the next few years everything that's fallen uh, everything that's happened with micropayments has fallen again on usability you know you had to go through too many steps to to allocate the payment and register and you know decide what, where the payment was going and what the amount was going to be so that what that comes up against is but coming back to the subscription model mm -hmm. and the book there that I found intriguing is uh, Kevin Kelly's the inevitable oh yeah yeah that's a good one yeah it's it's fun and mm -hmm. Kevin makes a really good point where where he's he says you know it's around the sort of Spotify model he, he but he talks about books specifically and he said, you know, I don't need to own them anymore. You know, like that paradigm for a man who's, you know, in his 70s and has owned books all his life and loves books and written a lot of books. I don't need to own them anymore. I'm happy to have them in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to – the other thing that was, you know, related to that is when I hear about a new book, our, our mode right now is, okay, I heard about a new book. Sounds good. I'll go. I'll buy it. I'll download it. And he's like, well, but if I know it's in the cloud, I don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can – I can keep track, keep reading the books I'm reading, knowing that, you know, if a couple of weeks from now I'm still interested, it's there for me. I don't have to have made that transaction. So you get the streaming of books. And that to him is inevitable as per the title of the book. And I think about that and I think... Yeah, you know, the subscription model, I had 19, in my startup list, there's 19 different companies that started up to try and tackle the subscription problem. All of them, except for uh, Scribd, Scribd. Scribd mm -hmm. has gone, and um, it, which has been very telling. And the book publishers don't show any kind of willingness around the copyright issues to enable um, a subscription. But if you're Kevin Kelly, it's inevitable. And that that's how I see solving the micropayments is via the Spotify model, where there will be the agency that does the microtransactions but aggregates the transfer of wealth. Mm, yeah, and I'm definitely aiming for that. I mean, again, I think as indie authors and as sort of being able to pivot and take advantage of global things with that, you know, the big publishers take ages to take advantage of this stuff. Whereas if yes. we can get in early, like I'm talking, actually, I should email you separately about this, but I'm talking to a guy in the Netherlands who has a startup doing secondhand ebook sales. Yes, that's been around for a while. Yeah. Not that startup, but that idea. Exactly. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. And COVID Kobo's just launched Kobo Plus in the Netherlands, which is a subscription model. So there's something in the Netherlands that means people aren't buying books, clearly. And maybe it's pricing, but maybe they're just, you know, maybe, yeah, prices are too high. So there's other ways. But I definitely see that there has to be a shift in this type of model over, over the next few years. So anyway, I've taken up so much of your time, but it's always oh, it's... awesome to talk to you, Thad. So tell people I where they it. can find all your stuff online. Everything's at thefutureofpublishing.com, and the, this report that I, I do recommend people read it. It's you know it's it's kind of fun. It gives you kind of oh gosh, I would never have thought nine hundred of them. Yeah, sort of the, anyway, that's for for download right on the home page, and you'll see a blog. My latest blog entry describes it, and also talks about the machine learning things we've been discussing. Those are my last two blog couple blog entries ago as well so so there's some stuff there that people might enjoy thanks so much for your time thad that was great oh i really enjoy it joanna